So now we can uh, introduce our speaker for today. I uh, assume that all of you know Torsten. Uh, big part on the uh, winning of the German team in the football cup. <laughs> One of the best women in the school. But also the father, or well known as the father of the PL. Although then there is question, what Rob is, if you are the father, what you will Rob see, is? You will see, you will okay. see, you will see. So there will be answer to this question, what is Rob? Yes. Uh, so Thorsten joined UNSW as 2001, and then uh, shortly after started to develop today, together with Rob, the PL Imaging. Uh, we celebrate now 10 years for PL Imaging, so the first paper was 2005-2006, so we wound it to now, and that will be the topic of this presentation. Uh, but That's good enough. No. So <laughs> first, probably you want a white with jacket, so I prepared like special uh, shirt. Oh, <laughs> well done. Do I, do I get one as well? Yeah, so, because <laughs> he agreed to be the last one. So we have, uh, yeah, so we had <laughs> the shirts. Where did you get it? Oh, wow. <laughs> that's, that's pretty so cool. You don't need to wear it now, but... Uh, I will put it on <laughs> afterwards, all right? Yeah, so... <laughs> and I know that some people, like, uh, I think that Paul Bassol said that uh, from characterization of silicon solar cells in the last 20 years, there is like two inventions that really changed the way that we do characterization. One is uh, the QSSPL and, and the QSSPC of Ron Sinton, and we had one a few weeks ago. And the other one is definitely uh, PL Imaging. So it's great to have Torsten here to, uh, to explain about uh, this te great technology that started here. More personally, Torsten, uh, I know him from my PhD. So he, uh, uh, we had a bit of chat on QSSPL, but then when I finished, he hired me as a postdoc for one year with BT Imaging. And we keep good rela uh, connection when I was in service. And in the last two years, he's great mentor for me. So it's not only a uh, pleasure to work with someone that is so expert, he's also like very nice friend, like a uh, great mentor to see how we do research, how he's doing, how we treat students. So thank you very much for the friendship, not only for the mentorship. So please welcome Torsten. So now what? All right, thank you very much, Ziv. And uh, of course, it's a great pleasure to be here and have the chance to give the last presentation in this free seminar. Um, the idea for this presentation actually, sorry, this is the first slide, came from uh, Ron Sinton, who invited me to give a talk at the uh, Crystalline Silicon Workshop earlier this year. And he pointed out to me that uh, the first paper on pure imaging was in 2006. And so it is actually the 10th birthday and thanks to Linda for organizing these beautiful uh, cup holders uh, to celebrate uh, that event. The original title slide for this presentation is actually this one here. This is an um, animated GIF uh, made from two PL images taken on a monocrystalline silicon solar cell. And uh, it's quite a special type of PL image, as you can see. And I will talk a bit more about this later on um, mm -hmm. as we go through the slides. This is intended not to be a very in-depth scientific talk. It's more really an overview to show you how the whole PL story evolved over the years. And in the second part of the talk, I will focus on what is currently happening here at UNSW in terms of uh, luminescence characterization work. Um, yeah, the, the slide, uh, this slide shows the contents. Um, as we celebrate the birthday of our children, what we normally do is we think about the times before the birth, then the days around the birth, how our children grow up, and then um, what, what they're currently doing. And that's exactly what I want to do here. So we'll talk initially about my own sort of scientific upbringing, and then uh, talk about the really exciting days of uh, when we first started PL Imaging work here at UNSW, then how it got adopted in the PV community, and then, as I said, in the, uh, the main part of the talk, talk about what, uh, what's currently happening here at UNSW. So the importance of good upbringing. Um, I have to mention Professor Peter Werfel, who was my PhD supervisor and also supervisor of my diploma thesis at the University of Karlsruhe, which is a small and very nice town in southern Germany. Peter really is an expert on all kinds of aspects of um, solar cell development, solar cell physics. 
He has written this well-known textbook, The Physics of Solar Cells. If you haven't read it yet, I recommend you do so because it provides a very different but very useful perspective on the, um, the fundamental um, functioning of a solar cell. So it's, it's really a very important book that helps you understand uh, a lot of what you're doing in your own work. Um, he was also an early adopter of luminescence and recognized the potential of luminescence and of course he developed a lot of the fundamental science and the equations that, uh, that are used to describe luminescence. So really he can be considered, if I'm the father of peel imaging, he can be considered the grandfather of peel imaging. Um, some background, the most important equation if we describe luminescence is called the generalized Planck law or the generalized Planck equation which is shown here on this, uh, on this slide. And the two most important parts of this equation are that first, the luminescence or the rate of spontaneous emission, of photon emission, is proportional, as you can see here, to the absorption coefficient. So that means the spectral distribution of the emission spectrum is determined by the, uh, the optical properties of the um, absorber. And that enables us to learn a lot about the actual and extract information about the absorption coefficient from luminescence data. The other key information here is that the absolute emission intensity is governed by this exponential term here in the denomina denominator, um, which contains the separation of the quasi-Fermi energies. And as you know, the quasi-Fermi energies are very closely linked to the voltage of a device. So when we look at luminescence emission, we can normally forget about that minus one here in the denominator. And then you can see that the luminescence emission is essen essentially just proportional to the exponential of the separation of the Fermi levels. So if we have an absolute luminescence intensity, we can interpret that in terms of the um, Fermi level split. And that is the basis for interpreting luminescence intensities in terms of so-called implied voltages. That is in in interesting in itself, but also the basis for more detailed analysis methods like series resistance analysis, which I'm going to talk about later on. So that's one aspect. The other one, of course, the luminescence intensity is also proportional to the NP product. You know, we have an electron and a hole recombining, emitting a photon. So at first order, the emission intensity is proportional to the electron and hole concentrations. And we can write this in terms of delta N, which is the excess minority carrier density. So that means luminescence intensities can be used to extract information about the excess minority carrier lifetime. And it is that relationship that we used in the first uh, two years when Rob and I started to work on luminescence uh, characterization here at UNSW. So you can see here a very young looking Robert Bardos and I um, started QSSPL work around 2002-2003 and this is the first setup that we built here in the labs. Of, back then it was in the old electrical engineering building. So we had a QSSPC set up from Ron Sinton and we modified it to have a um, photoluminescent sensor. And we also replaced the flash with an LED, high, high intensity LED source, um, added a couple of filters and reference diet and so on. And also we replaced the fairly old fashioned data acquisition system with a um, state of the art multi-channel data acquisition board. So this system was used to get the first injection-dependent QSSPL lifetime data and we used it on very high quality 1000 ohm centimeter n-type wafers and we were able to show that these wafers had lifetimes exceeding 100 milliseconds, the highest lifetime ever reported up to now actually. Um, this data was reported in this conference paper in Paris in 2004. Um, the data are still somewhat controversial because some people don't believe that 100 millisecond lifetime is actually realistic. Um, we do still have some of these wafers and we're now in the process of applying modern um, passivation techniques to see if we can replicate those measurements from 2004. Um, so we will see whether these data are real or not. The most important part of this conference poster was that Ron came to see it and he liked it. So he uh, came over. I was excited to see him. He was sort of the main capacity in this whole sector and he seemed to like the idea of using PL for uh, lifetime characterization and that encouraged us to um, sort of carry on with that work. This slide shows you um, that we do indeed get excellent agreement between QSSPL and QS QSSPC. So QSSPC of course is the main and most widely used technique to measure injection dependent lifetime on silicon wafers. And we showed that on most samples, or many samples, we get very nice agreement between those two. On the other hand, in the early 2000s, it turned out that QSSPC can be affected by a number of 
um, experimental artifacts due to, for example, the so-called DRM effect, minority carrier trapping, and in the meantime, several others have been identified. And what that means is that the measured lifetime that you get from QSSPC shoots up here at low um, excess carrier densities to very unrealistically high values. And what we were able to show is that PL is not affected by these artifacts. So QSSPL is the only technique that can measure the true excess minority carrier lifetime at low to medium, uh, medium injection level conditions. So that was a big advantage and back then we were very excited and we thought that QSSPL would take over and QSSPC was a, a thing of the past. The reality is of course that QSSPC is still very widely used and it is actually now used here um, in a complementary fashion. So we have QSSPL and QSSPC both being used in their, be in their best operating conditions really. So after we've sh we had shown that PL is a very useful technique, we thought multi-crystalline wafers are very non-uniform, so how can we measure photoluminescence in a spatially resolved fashion? So I actually set up this um, measurement system shown here, which is a, spectrum, a spectroscopic luminescence system, which measures the full luminescence spectrum, with, um, combined with an XYZ stage, which enables you to measure um, basically photoluminescence maps with very high spatial resolution, like we got, uh, we used a blue laser and we got below one micron uh, resolution with that system. So that is quite nice and you see here, this is a, a PL image of a, a multi-crystalline wafer, about three by four centimeters in size. And we get very nice data from this system. Here's another example, this is a buried contact solar cell where you can see the reduction in lifetime near the, uh, the metal fingers. But the main downside of that system was that it was uh, relatively slow. So it would take several hours to measure a high resolution scan like this on that system. So Rob and I um, decided to look into camera-based luminescence imaging. And this is where the whole PL imaging story really started. Now, of course, when you're deciding to have children, you, you should actually think about, can we actually afford this? And uh, back then, this is actually an interesting story. Um, Rob and I, we didn't have our own funding, but we were part of the Center of Excellence back then. And I remember I sent an email to Martin um, on a Sunday afternoon, believe it or not, um, explaining to him that we wanted to look into PL imaging and asking him for about $50,000 in funding. And um, incredibly, 15 minutes later, I got a response from Martin saying, yes, no worries, that sounds good. Get the account number from Jenny on Monday and I can provide more funding for this if necessary because I like your characterization work. So this is, um, for most people, really a, a unprecedented or um, a very unusual process which really enabled us to get going with this um, development straight away. So the Monday we sent the PO out for the camera, uh, eight weeks later we had the first peel imaging system set up. In other circumstances you would have started to look into a discovery grant and maybe one and a half, two years later you would have been able to buy equipment. So this was excellent and uh, yeah, maybe we can look at Martin as the second grandfather of peel imaging <laughs> in that sense. Um, so that was great and here is actually a picture of the first peel imaging system in LG24 in the um, electrical engineering building. We had a couple of actual challenges to overcome in this. Yeah? We are talking about luminescence images which are measured on six inch wafers, which we want to illuminate with at least one sun equivalent intensity. So we figured out we needed more than 100 watt laser intensity and up to then we had used lasers with 50, 100 milliwatt intensity and had to go through all kinds of laser safety um, uh, issues around those. Now we're talking a factor of 1,000 more and that was a very big challenge and I guess that's why Robert is looking so concerned in that picture up there. Um, so basically we didn't have much space, we only had the one room in LG24 so the, the mapping tool that I had set up unfortunately had to go. Um, Rob and I turned out to be a really good team working very nicely together with complementary skills. Rob looked a lot more into the sort of the, the hardware components whereas I sort of quickly set them up and wrote the software. The software was written in LabVIEW and unfortunately this week I found out that it has been decommissioned by Matthias who replaced it with a, a Python code, but that's the way it goes I guess. Um, yeah, and then, then we took our first PL images and, and they were really eureka moments. It, it was, it's hard to describe the excitement when you have a system that enables you to do a measurement that you previously took like several hours and you, you then put a sample into that black box, you press a button and half a second later you have 
a much better quality image. That was really exciting and it was followed by months, if not years, of a really exciting work here at UNSW and elsewhere. And that system is actually still in operation um, here at UNSW, just across the hall here in LG25. So this is one of the very first PL images that we measured. On the left again is um, a result from this mapping tool. And as I said, this took several hours, typically one millimeter per pixel spatial resolution. This measurement was done in less than a second uh, with less than 100 micrometer spatial resolution. So you can see orders of magnitude uh, improvement in measurement time and image quality. So following that, um, the PL imaging technology really very rapidly took off here at UNSW, especially Jeff Cotter, who was leading the buried contact solar cell development here, basically switched to PL imaging from one day to the next. And within a week, they were using PL imaging on a daily basis for their process monitoring. And you can see why. These are all examples of samples that they measured. And there's all kinds of problems with wafer quality, with processing, with, with wafer handling that they found that they were completely unaware of, which had a major impact on their um, sort of cell efficiency output and um, and it really w was that sort of sort of that rapid feedback that they got from the peel imaging that helped them um, yeah, improve their processes uh, dramatically. So very rapid adoption of this technique here at UNSW and of course we then started publishing stuff. In 2006 we had the first paper jointly with our colleagues from Fraunhofer ESA um, at Fraunhofer back then, they were working on a technique called carrier density imaging, which is a far infrared imaging technique, which is looking at the absorption or emission from free carriers. And they proposed it back then also as a technique to get spatially resolved lifetime uh, data. Um, PL imaging really has taken um, the steam out of that development completely, unfortunately for them. But uh, we worked together and we showed that PL images can actually be calibrated into absolute minority carrier lifetime images. So the scale here, the color scale, shows the minority carrier lifetime in this 10 by 10 centimeter sample in uh, microseconds. And we found here that you got very nice agreement between those two techniques. That's the wrong way. So this is really the birth of PL imaging, 2006, when the first paper was published. Uh, so here, this is the birth certificate, and you can see, um, Ziv, this is the answer. I'm the father, Rob is the mother. <laughs> <laughs> That's the benefit you have when you prepare the presentation. I had the choice of making <laughs> Rob the mother. But um, the reality is the, it, it has two fathers and two grandfathers, so it's a very modern family, in a sense. <laughs> What's also good to see is that um, from the date the paper was received to the date it was published is exactly nine months, so that's the way it is for a healthy baby. And uh, <laughs> um, yeah, a very healthy baby it was, uh, for sure. Um, we then moved on to develop specific anal analysis methods based on luminescence imaging. And one very, very important <laughs> one is serious resistance imaging. So the first indication that PIL can be used for serious resistance uh, measurements was uh, this set of data that we presented in 2006 in Denver. So here you see three images taken on the same uh, monocrystalline cell. On the left-hand side you take an electroluminescence image where you drive current into the cell. The middle one is a conventional PIL image taken with um, uniform illumination and the right-hand one is taken where we illuminate the cell but we extract current from the cell during the measurement. So the cell is essentially held at, at the maximum power point during the measurement. And you can see that those three PL images show some features which are visible in each image, but some are completely different. In particular, we saw this dark patch here in the middle, which completely disappears in the PL image. And we initially couldn't figure out what, what was going on there. Then when we took the PL image with current extraction, we saw that this dark feature completely inverts its contrast and appears as a bright feature in the, in the PL image with current extraction. And we realized that this is related to local variations in the contact resistance, the series resistance of the cell. To briefly explain that, if you look at a very simple circuit diagram where we ideally you know, consider a solar cell that has two sides, one half has zero series resistance, the other half has some finite series resistance. If you, if you imagine applying a voltage to this device, it's clear that some of this voltage will drop over the series resistance here, which means a smaller voltage will drop over the junction here, and that corresponds to lower luminescence emission. Whereas the full voltage drops here, which means higher luminescence emission. And if you now do this, the same thing in reverse, illuminating the cell and extracting current, then you basically can't extract the current 
from this part of the cell so efficiently, which means it remains at a higher voltage, and therefore the luminescence intensity in this area is higher. So this explains qualita qualitatively why these features occur. And of course, we then proceeded to, to develop this, these qualitative observations into a quantitative series resistance imaging uh, method. And uh, back then, Ed Pink was involved. He actually did a lot of the theory behind this. And we showed that a series resistance image can be extracted from a combination of two PL images, one measured at VOC and one measured at MPP. So the VOC image gives you the lifetime variations. The MPP image gives you a combination of lifetime and series resistance. And combining those two essentially allows you to uh, separate those two things from each other, resulting in a quantitative effective local series resistance image in ohm centimeter squared. Um, Henna actually was my PhD student back then. He's, of course, now an academic here. He developed a very nice subsequent advanced analysis method, which is now actually incorporated in our commercial PL systems. Now, one thing that popped up during those uh, days was quite of kind of unexpected, and that is when we looked at the solar cell under illumination and set the voltage to zero, essentially short circuit the cell, the, lumi the, the cell still emitted luminescence. Now, if you remember the, the equation on one of the first slides, you would expect that if the voltage goes to zero, the luminescence should also go to zero, but it didn't. And we couldn't work out initially what, that was, uh, what, what was causing that. Um, shortly after, Malcolm Abbott did some work and f figured that this is related to so-called diffusion-limited carriers. And more recently, um, Matthias Juhl, who is now a postdoc here, has looked into this in terms of voltage-independent carriers. So let me quickly talk about that a little bit. So if we look at the continuity equation of a um, silicon device, we can find this analytical solution shown here, which is the sum of different exponential terms with different um, coefficients, CA, CB, and CC. And the solution of this equation can be written as the sum of two individual contributions. One is the voltage dependent and one the voltage independent contribution. And those are individually listed here. And you can see that there's one carrier distribution that increases exponentially with the voltage, as we expect, but there's also a carrier distribution which is completely separate from um, uh, the applied voltage. So if, even if the voltage is zero, this carrier density is still present in the wafer, and it is that carrier density that we saw in these series resistance measurements under short circuit conditions. Now, to give you an example how this looks in practice, this is the carrier density in a, in a wafer or in a solar cell where we apply a voltage in the dark, voltage about 625 millivolts. And then here, you see the carrier density under illumination with 1,100 nanometer excitation, where we've chosen the intensity to be the same, to be such that the voltage at the junction is the same as in the EL case. And you see that those carrier distributions are different. You have extra carriers in the photoluminescence case compared to the electroluminescence case. Now, if you take the same illuminated case but set the, the junction to zero voltage, in other words, short circuit the cell, we can see that we have this carrier density here in the bulk of the solar cell. We see the carrier density is zero at the front. This represents the fact that the voltage is zero, but there is a finite carrier distribution inside the bulk of the cell, and it is those carriers that we see in the luminescence. Now, what's interesting is that if we add this blue carrier density to the, to the electroluminescence carrier distribution, we end up back with the carrier distribution under illumination and under open circuit conditions. And that is just a confirmation of what we've seen in the equations before. And that is that this carrier density is present at any voltage and it just adds on top of the carrier distribution that you have in the EL case under any voltage. Now, the same situation of simulation can be done for shorter excitation. This is 750 nanometer excitation. And you can see that things change quite dramatically. In this case, the um, voltage independent carrier distribution is almost zero. Um, and the reason for that is, of course, that we're then generating the carriers very close to the junction. It's almost the same as if we um, inject the carriers electrically. So there's no difference, and therefore, there's no voltage independent carrier distribution for short um, illumination wavelengths. So this is all information that was relevant for Matthias' thesis, because he was looking at uh, how we analyze PL images or PL data in general with different illumination wavelengths. And um, he had to sort of quantify how this voltage independent carrier density depends on the illumination wavelength. Okay. 
Now, I said before, um, following our first publications on this, there was a wide range of um, applications and a number of people working on this here at UNSW and elsewhere. We've had collaborations with ANU, ISE, ISFH, NREL, MPI in, in, um, in Halle. And a lot of groups now also work independently on PL applications. It's, it's too many applications to really go through in any detail. Um, but yeah, a lot of the people here in this room have, have made uh, significant uh, contributions to these various um, quantitative analysis methods. Yeah. So in 2007, we had a visitor from REC in Norway, and they expressed quite sincere, um, this is Jürgen Nyhus, actually. Um, and he had seen some of our publications and presentations at the conferences, and he was very interested in the fact that we claim to be able to measure SCART wafers uh, with PL imaging in very short uh, periods of time and with very high spatial resolution. So he came to Australia to see for himself, and he was so impressed with the, um, the measurement results that he said, if you can provide me with a system, I will buy it tomorrow. And that was without us ever having built a system or anything like that. So this showed us that there was substantial commercial interest in this, in, this, in this technology. And so then Robert and I decided to start a company. And after about two years of haggling with the university's commercial um, arm, we actually finally managed to start the company BT Imaging. And we built the first system in 2007 and presented it at a trade show in Milan in 2008. And that is the system that went eventually to REC and which is still in use today. So before I continue, maybe quickly a um, few, few words on different ways how to measure PL images. Huh? So the first one is called area scanning. So this is the conventional way how you do PL imaging, where you excite the entire sample uniformly, normally with a laser or with an LED, and you then take a camera to take an image of the luminescence emission while the laser is on. So this is just the same as when you take a photo with your iPhone, basically. The other approach is called line scanning. So what we do there is we just have a line camera and a line illumination on the sample. And here we show this for a silicon brick. And then the sample is moved at constant speed through that system and the camera is read in sync with the sample motion and then the, the image is, is sort of assembled in that fashion. And this is something that can be done at very high sample speeds, in our case up to 500 millimeters per second. And of course this sort of measurement is, leans itself very much to inline applications in production where samples are anyway um, in motion and where this enables the measurements without interrupting the workflow. So the line scanning system was developed uh, for initially by our company BT Imaging for SCART wafer inspection. We now have SCART wafer inspection systems in place which measure 5,400 silicon wafers per hour. So you can see that really has taken off and it's, it's a very sort of impressive development over the years that we can now do this really at, at such high speeds in, in, in uh, mass manufacturing. And the features we see in the images um, are related, as you can see here, the, the, the black defects which are highlighted in blue here, these are structural defects in the multicrystalline wafers related to dislocations, and these have a very strong impact on the solar cell efficiency. The other type of defects here highlighted in yellow um, from automated image processing are related to um, iron concentration, which is often found in the vicinity of the edge or the corner of a brick. And again, these are detrimental for solar cell uh, performance. And what we have shown in previous trials is that the defects that you see in the raw wafer, shown here on the left, remain as recombination active defects in the finished cells. And that in turn allows us to make a prediction of, on the efficiency based on the features that we see in the raw wafers. Yeah? And here you can see that in a large-scale trial with, with thousands of wafers, we've been able to get a very nice correlation between the measured efficiency of the cells in manufacturing and the predicted efficiency shown here as a function of the so-called Q factor, which is a metric that we use at BT Imaging. So this is great. Um, unfortunately, wafers that people use today, high-performance multi-wafers, do not have these sort of extensive dislocation networks anymore. Wafer quality, ha quality has improved a lot and that also is to a large extent I think due to the, to the availability of PL imaging. The next uh, application is on silicon bricks and this is where Bernard has uh, contributed a lot during his PhD and now together with Daniel um, in, in current work that we do as part of an ARENA project. Um, 
Brick inspection has one major advantage over wafer inspection, and that is that you can still measure bulk lifetime. This graph here shows the effective measured lifetime as a function of the bulk lifetime for a 200 micrometer thin, thin unpassivated wafer and for an unpassivated silicon brick. And you can see that here the black line saturates once we reach bulk lifetimes of 10 microseconds or more the effective lifetime on the wafer essentially has no information about the actual bulk because it completely becomes dominated by the surface recombination. The situation is different for a brick. Yeah, that's shown here basically. This entire range of bulk lifetime is basically squeezed. Hang on, I had this. Oh, it doesn't work. Anyway, on the S-cut wafer, this entire lifetime range is squeezed into this narrow gray bar, whereas on a brick, we have still a factor of 10 in measured lifetime, which enables us to correlate the measured lifetime with the bulk lifetime. So how do we do this? Um, Bernard has developed the so-called photoluminescence intensity uh, ratio method. So what you see here, if we just concentrate at the, on, the, on the measurements at 300 Kelvin, the two blue lines, you can see that if we look at a luminescence emi emission from the surface, which is shown at, as the uh, dotted line, and compare it with the emission from, uh, of a photon that comes from, say, one millimeter depth, we can see that the spectrum is essentially the, the same at long wavelengths but it changes quite a bit at short wavelengths, and that is because of reabsorption. So the photons on their way to the surface get reabsorbed partially, um, which means that the shorter wavelength emission in the spectrum is only sensitive to the carrier density at the surface, whereas the, the, um, the emission at longer wavelengths looks deeper into the brick. And that is what we, uh, I'll skip this one, that's what we use in this two filter method. So we take a first image at short wavelengths, and then a second image at longer wavelengths, and then we take the ratio of those two PL intensities, and then we can calculate the bulk lifetime from that ratio based on first principles. And the nice thing about that is that background doping variations cancel out in this, in this ratio. This was uh, first shown by Bernard in a paper in 2011, and this is now uh, used in one of our commercial systems as well. So here you see a bulk lifetime image on a multi-crystalline brick on the left hand side. So you can see the scale here is from 0 to 150 microseconds. So the best regions in this brick have about 150 microsecond bulk lifetime. But we are also able to measure much higher lifetimes, up to 6.5 milliseconds in this um, CZ ingot. And in the meantime, Daniel actually recently showed that up to 20 millisecond lifetime can reliably be measured using this technique. So this is quite an important quality control technique for um, early material characterization. Yeah, here you see that we can do this, do this sort of three-dimensional simulation of the brick surfaces and um, you see the improvement in brick quality really between 2011 and 2015. Again, this is data Daniel has published, um, especially in terms of these dark patterns that you see. You see lots of them in the left-hand side and not so many on the right-hand side. And that really represents the reduction in dislocation density in this material, which has led to si substantial improvements in, in cell efficiency in, in multicrystalline cell manufacturing. We can, of course, use automated image processing to characterize uh, these uh, defects. And this is what people use in production now for very quick feedback. So that in, in, in previous times, people would have to cut this brick into wafers, make them into cells. Now you get the fast feedback from this measurement technique to, s to show the sort of the, the defect density straight after cutting the brick. Yeah, and this is one of the systems that we've recently uh, introduced into the market as BT Imaging. This is a brick inspection tool uh, which people use in production as a cutting guide and for the bulk lifetime and defect analysis. So yeah, that takes me to uh, where we are today. Uh, so it, basically, PL imaging is now the equivalent of a teenager, uh, although it's only 10 years old. Um, and teenagers seem to know everything, and they seem to, be, uh, seem to know everything better than their parents. But uh, in reality, is of course, uh, they still have a lot to learn. And in the same sense, we have already done a lot on PL imaging, but there's still a lot to be done. And there's quite a wide range of activities uh, in our group here at, at UNSW at the moment. Uh, all this is funded by ARENA. Uh, we have a joint project with um, our colleagues from uh, the Australian National University 
um, and we hope that we can continue this work for a couple of years to come uh, with additional arena funding, hopefully. Um, yeah, you all know the TTB building. The left here shows the new lab, LG25, so that's a nice uh, logical succession to LG24 from the previous building. And we have a really nice uh, large laboratory there, um, thanks to Ziff who has, and Oliver, I guess, who have done a lot of work uh, making sure that it's all um, fit out properly and, and so on. And, uh, if you're interested, uh, you're more than welcome to take a look what's going on there. And in the next couple of slides, I will show you what we're actually doing in this lab at the moment. So back to this slide, um, remind you that if we take a luminescence image on a cell with serious resistance, if we extract current from that cell uh, during the measurement, we get a bright pattern, okay? So now we have, we look at this cell, which is a computer simulation using the program Gridler, in which we just assume we have a uniform monocrystalline <laughs> cell which has two areas of enhanced series resistance, one patch in the top, which is circular a region of enhanced contact resistance, and then a couple of broken fingers at the bottom. So one of my current students, Iskra Zaviroska, has done some Gridler simulations on this, and she has simulated what happens in this cell when we do a line scanning image. I talked to you before about the uh, idea of doing line scanning PL. So you have a illumination line with a certain width, and then you get a PL distribution from this cell, and this is all simulated. And this chart here on the right-hand side shows you a cross-section through this sort of uh, dotted region from left to right. And you can see that, as you might expect, the PL intensity is very high in the area where the cell is illuminated, and it's almost zero outside that region. Right? So this is all as we would expect. But now let's take a look what happens with the same simu uh, simulation when we go to much lower illumination intensity. Uh, this is the same simulation, but with about one sun local illumination where the um, illumination line is located. And we then get this profile. It looks similar, but please note the scale here. It's from 29 to 33 counts. So what this means is that in the areas that are not illuminated, the PL counts are almost the same as they are in the area where we illuminated. So why is that? The cell is very efficient in transporting current laterally. So the cell is not contacted, yeah? it's all under open circuit. But the cell, if you illuminate it in the middle, creates a voltage. Outside that region, there's no voltage. So that's the driving force for carriers to flow laterally. And you can see that at low intensities, this happens very efficiently. Yeah? So almost all the current that we drive into the cell optically in this line flows into other areas of the cell. And what that means is that in the area where we measure, which, which is in this illuminated section, we have PL with current extraction. Yeah? For, the, for the PL, it doesn't matter whether you extract the current from the terminals or whether the current just disappears into the dark regions of the cell. Yeah? So this is basically the idea why we are able to measure serious resistance without even making contact to the cell, yeah? due to this very efficient lateral current spreading. Now here, this is the same uh, simulation, but in this case, Iskra has put the illumination line into this area where we have those um, series resistance patterns. And you can see the same effect occurs that I've shown you before for the full area images. Yeah? And then if Iskra puts all this information together to simulate the full line scan image, we get this. Yeah? And it shows that if we take a line scan image with local series resistance patterns, then these patterns show up in the image. Under open circuit, externally, and with the sample in motion. So who would have thought that, that you can take a serious resistance image on a cell while the cell moves through a measurement system at 300 millimeters per second without even making contact. So this is pretty remarkable, I think. And it allows us, enables us to do quite a few cool things. So this is now an experimental peel image taken with such a line scan system. And you can see that all these bright lines pop up and these are representing broken fingers. A broken finger causes a serious resistance effect. And this is now, um, clearly visible in the, in the PL image. Yeah? So this image was taken with rather low illumination. If we now increase the illumination intensity to medium intensity and to high intensity, you can see that these series resistance patter patterns disappear. And this is because at high intensity, the lateral current extraction essentially doesn't work. Yeah? So we can use those features now for more reliable um, pattern extraction from the PL images. Um, for example, to count the number of broken fingers um, in addition to all these uh, dis dislocation patterns that I've mentioned before. 
So that's pretty cool. Uh, what's even better is Iskra is actually doing her PhD on module inspection. So she is now able to take full area PL images using line scanning on uh, yeah, fully assembled uh, large one, one meter by two meter large modules. And this is an image she has uh, measured recently. You can see we get exceptional image quality. If we zoom into this image, you can see each image is, is really beautiful. Uh, quality and we get the same patterns that I've shown you in the in the previous slide um, for, for the individual Im uh, cells. I think I need to speed up a bit. Um, this is the EL image. We can use the same system for EL and then if we um, process e these two images together you can see that we can every very very re reliably pinpoint those uh, serious resistance problems in a module which you would never find in, a, in, a, in an EL image. So we believe um, that this approach of measuring luminescence imaging is far superior to electroluminescence and we have high hopes that this will be adopted in the future as a standard quality control procedure for module inspection at the end of um, production line or for incoming quality in, uh, control by installers um, and so forth. So, um, let's talk about uh, the measurement systems that ZIF has set up. Um, ZIF has built this beautiful system in LG25, which is a temperature-dependent QSS-PC and QSS-PL measurement system. So you can really think of it as the mother of all lifetime systems. Um, it covers a very right temperature range from minus 200 to 400 degrees C. It has PL and PC. We can switch between different illumination sources, LEDs, lasers, flash, and what have you. Um, it enables front and rear detection, and I'll talk a bit about that. Um, we have a corona charger to charge surfaces, so it really is, is it's an extremely versatile and uh, useful tool, well designed, and we're now starting to use that for the characterization of all kinds of um, defects and processes. And I'll show you one example. This is data that Mallory Jensen has uh, measured recently. She actually came from MIT to Australia just to be able to use that system. Um, and yeah, she's been able to do these um, lifetime measurements uh, at different temperatures using QSSPL at low in uh, injection and PC at high injection. And uh, yeah, as I said, we're only really starting to, to use it for the characterization of a range of defects. Another example shown here, chromium <coughs> and iron. So when you do the analysis properly, you can plot the effective lifetime over the temperature and based on the shockley reed hall theory, you can then extract um, the defect parameters like the, the energy uh, position or the capture cross-section ratio. And that then gives you an indication about what defect you might have in your material. And in this first work, we showed that um, yeah, the system works really well and uh, that the, the para parameters from the literature could be confirmed uh, very accurately. And not only can we do this, we can also do this now uh, in an imaging fashion where we take images at different temperatures and then we can analyze different locations of the wafer in terms of the defect parameters. And eventually we hope that this might actually enable a spatially resolved sort of characterization of the wafer in terms of the dominant um, a defect in the wafer. That's uh, pretty cool stuff and will probably result in a, long, a number of publications uh, to come very soon. Uh, the next topic is SUNS PL. Um, this is an old data set that I presented in 2005 where we looked at the comparison between SUNS VOC and SUNS PL. So SUNS VOC, we measure the voltage of a solar cell and we vary the illumination intensity and then plot the illumination intensity over the voltage which gives you the equivalent of an IV curve. The idea there is that the illumination intensity under open circuit condition is equivalent to the recombination rate and the recombination rate is equivalent to the current. So essentially you get current on the y-axis and voltage on the x-axis. And here we measured the voltage, the PL intensity and the illumination intensity, and then we plotted the illumination intensity over voltage and over the implied voltage that we get from PL. And you see that we get very nice agreement over a very wide range of the IV curve. So what that means is that we can measure the IV curve in a contactless fashion using PL. And that means we can measure IV curves on wafers. We don't even need a contact structure for that anymore. There was a discrepancy here that we observed back then in the high intensity range and we didn't really quite understand what was going on. And this is something that Robert Dumbrell is currently, oh sorry, oh, that doesn't belong here. Oh, okay. 
Okay, the slides are a bit out of order here. <laughs> I'll get back to that. Um, peel imaging on perovskites, we're, we've done some nice work. Aman has done some really nice analysis here showing that the exponential relationship that we expect for the photoluminescence intensity as a function of the voltage is actually observed experimentally on this new type of uh, solar cells, but that there's a couple of uh, potential pitfalls. You know, you have to be sure that you have uh, uh, do the measurements correctly and that you um, um, do some light soaking beforehand, otherwise you measure some, some weird effects. So I can't go into more detail here, but this is another area that we're currently quite active in. Um, Robert is doing some measurements using the front detection system on fully metallized cells, which is pretty cool. So here we show that the lifetime, the minority care lifetime can now be measured on fully metallized cells, which was not possible previously because, yeah, Sinton measurements can't be done on metallized cells. And here he showed that he gets very nice agreement between the PL data and uh, lifetime data extracted from uh, VOC measurements. So that is very nice and also subject to ongoing work. That's a slide I wanted to show you before. Um, so this is not published yet, but will be published soon, I hope. Uh, Robert, right? <laughs> Um, so what you see here is that this small effect that I'd shown you before on the slide actually becomes quite dramatic at higher intensities and not just for some weird um, specially prepared cells but on some quite normal PERC or standard BSF cells. We see this discrepancy between the measured voltage and the implied voltage that we get from PL and this is quite interesting. Um, it has a number of implications, one of them being that VOC measurements cannot be reliably interpreted in terms of lifetime measurements at high injection and that's something that we're currently exploring further and yeah hopefully there'll be some publications around this uh, as well in the near future. This one is an interesting one. You can see here that for this LFC cell um, the voltage actually falls back so if you increase the intensity the voltage actually becomes smaller and this is uh, interpreted in terms of a Schottky diode on the rear of the solar cell so that diode turns on um, as you increase the, um, the illumination intensity and then basically the voltage basically acts against the main uh, diode voltage. Yeah, that takes me to the first slide. So this is a PL image measured with a new PL imaging system that we've set up here at, uh, in the lab. The system uses a so-called digital mirror device for illumination and it allows us to take a PL image with local illumination. So we, we can now create any illumination pattern that we like. So in this case, Jan, who is a PhD student working on this, has created this birthday cake and he illuminated the, a monocrystalline solar cell just in the areas which appear bright here. Yeah? And while this is nice, it is also quite unexpected. Yeah? So this is data from the first PL paper that we published. In this case, on the right hand side, Malcolm Abbott wrote the letters Unis W into the wafer with a laser. So he created local damage in the wafer which causes low lifetime. And at high intensity, we can clearly see the UNSW logo. But then as we, g as we go to lower intensities, equivalent to the ones at which this other image is measured, the, the contrast washes out completely. And it is the same effect that I discussed before. This lateral current is basically balancing the voltage across the device and washes out any local features. So surprisingly, this does not happen in this image. Yeah? This is measured at about 0.3 suns, and the contrast does not wash out at all. And uh, it's an interesting question. So we call this the Chris K conundrum, and I would <laughs> encourage you to think about uh, what could be causing this. So it'll be interesting to see who can work it out. If you have listened to the presentation, you should be able to work it out. Uh, the last one is a work that a uh, PhD student Apu is um, working on at the moment. So he has set up an LED-based illumination system which can um, illuminate with a number of illumination wavelengths from the blue through to the infrared. So we can now take PL images with a range of illumination wavelengths and there's quite a, a few things that we expect to be able to learn from that as well. One example is shown here. This is data from Matthias Jules thesis where he has shown that we can measure the equivalent of EQE by measuring photoluminescence intensities with variable illumination intensity and monitoring the PL response from the wafer. And what he's shown here is if we compare the top curve with the bottom curve this is basically two different types of samples with different silicon nitrides, one with a um, much better and the other one with a poorer um, uh, blue response. The solid lines represent the measured EQE on finished solar cells and the symbols represent the EQE he measured in a contactless fashion on the wafers and it shows you that it all works 
really rather well. So we essentially now have a contactless technique to measure EQE on solar cells and on solar cell precursors. So that's pretty cool. And this is what uh, um, Apu will now try to evolve into in terms of a spatially resolved imaging technique. Yeah, see it's one o'clock, so that takes me to the uh, conclusion. Um, ten years of development of PIL imaging. PIL imaging has come a long way. I would like to thank the outstanding team here at UNSW, all the current and previous students who have made really important uh, contributions to this. Of course, my colleagues at BT Imaging. Um, and uh, yeah, UNSW team is happy to collaborate. I thank ARENA for the funding and hope that they will continue to fund us uh, for a couple of years to come. Uh, you don't think so? Well, ah. six, six years to come. Six years to come. <laughs> yeah, and thank you for your attention. Yeah, we can also have a look into the lab. If you're interested, it's just across the hall. So if anyone wants to have a look, we can have a quick tour. So let's thank uh, Thorsten again.